This video is an introduction to the movements, muscles and potential injuries of the back. It's also been an opportunity for me to buy two packs of donuts, but we'll get to that in a bit. First, let's look at the movement. The spine can move in four different ways. Flexion and extension. Lateral flexion to either side. And then rotation. These movements are made possible by the joints between the vertebra. First we have facet joints, formed between the superior and inferior facets of the vertebra. These dictate the types of movements available in each region of the spine. We also have cartilaginous joints that connect the vertebral bodies together, known as the intervertebral discs. These discs are composed of a fibrous outer layer, the annulus fibrosus, and a soft jelly-like centre, the nucleus pulposus, making them the anatomical equivalent of a jam donut. The discs allow a small amount of movement between the vertebra, but primarily act as a shock absorber for any forces travelling through the spine. The intervertebral discs aren't found everywhere. In the sacrum, the bones are fused together, and the coccyx doesn't bear any weight. Neither region will have these discs. They're also absent in the upper cervical region, because here we have two special joints. First we have the articulation between the occipital bone at the base of the skull and the first cervical vertebra. This vertebra is also called the atlas, as it supports the weight of the skull, like the Greek titan who held up the heavens. The joint between these bones is known as the atlanto-occipital joint, and allows the head to rock backwards and forwards. We also have a special joint between C1 and C2. Here the odontoid peg of the second cervical vertebra pushes up into the space where the vertebral body of the atlas should be. A transverse ligament passes behind the peg, holding it in place and allowing the atlas to rotate around it, like a wheel on an axle. Because of this, another name for C2 is the axis, making this joint the atlanto-atrial joint. These two joints are responsible for most of the movements in the neck. The atlanto-occipital contributes to around half of all flexion and extension, with the atlanto atrial joint allowing a wide range of rotation. Next we come to the muscles. Now the muscles in the back are split into several groups, and there are quite a few I could talk about, but for this video I'll just be concentrating on some of the major groups. First we have the erector spiny group. These muscle fibres traverse the length of the back, and as the name suggests, help to extend our spine into an upright position. We can also use the muscles on one side of the body to laterally flex the spine. The erector spiny group can be split into three pairs of muscles. Laterally we have fibres passing from the ilium of the pelvis to the ribs, or in Latin, the costa. This will be iliocostalis. Medial to that are the longest fibres that pass all the way to the head, forming the super long longissimus muscle. Finally we have a small muscle that passes between the spinous bodies of adjacent vertebra, and this is spinalis. Now sometimes people may refer to these muscles more precisely, based on which region of the spine they're found in. So for example you might hear someone refer to longissimus lumborum, or iliocostalis thoracis. Deep to erector spiny, we have some smaller muscles that rotate the spine and help maintain our posture. The deep rotators pass from the transverse process of one vertebra to the spinous process of another. As they contract, they pull these attachments closer together, rotating the spine. These deep muscles can be split into three main groups. Rotatores, multifidus, and semispinalis. All of them have a similar course and a similar action. The only difference is how many vertebrae they cross, and the regions that they're found in. Finally, I'd like to look at some of the ways the back can be injured. One of the most common ways this can happen is when trying to lift a heavy object. Now if you need to lift a substantial weight, you're always given the same advice. Get someone else to do it. But if that doesn't work, you're advised to keep your back straight and let your legs do the work. Why is this? Well, when we try to lift something, the weight of that object wants to pull our body downwards, flexing the spine. To stop this from happening, we need to use our erector spiny muscles to extend the back and keep it straight. If we start off with a straight back, this works perfectly. 
those long muscle fibres will pass behind the spine, pulling it backwards and helping to maintain that extended position. But what about when we try to pick something up with a bent back? Well, when the back is flexed, something odd happens. Because many of the erector spiny muscles only attach at either end of the spine, flexion can result in these fibres moving anteriorly. When this happens, those muscles will now work as flexors of the back rather than extensors. That means that only a small portion of erector spiny can still be used to extend the spine. This puts a significant strain on the muscle fibres and potentially damages them. Loading weight onto a bent spine can also damage the intervertebral disc. Although these are designed to absorb forces passing through the spine, they work best when the spine is straight and the forces are evenly spread out across the whole disc. In the flex position, forces are disproportionately channeled through the anterior portion of the disc. This can result in the nucleus pulposus being pushed out from the centre and prolapsing through the annulus fibrosus. In other words, a flipped disc. So, that's a quick introduction to the muscles and movement of the back. If you have any questions, please just get in touch. But otherwise, thank you for watching, take care, and I'll see you again soon.